Happy Wednesday, everybody. Dr. Muse here with Dr. Alm with another clinical coffee chat. The topic that I came up with today stems from a lot of questions that we got from a previous coffee chat where we talked about the current state of, of the medical world and kind of what our thoughts on that were. And, and just to kind of give you an overview of that, oftentimes what we see is that it's, we kind of consider it to be flipped on its head a little bit. A lot of times people will go to the more aggressive treatments such as surgery much sooner than what we deem necessary. And instead we should be treating conservatively first and then kind of go through those progressions to, to get to that point. So that's what we're going to touch on a little bit today. So the topic of today is primarily how do we go through that full progression to decide when surgery is warranted? Yeah, I mean, surgery is obviously in, in, in some cases it's going to be warranted. <clears throat> surgery is sort of like permanent change to your structure. And so I always, or we always think that you wanna kind of keep the, the anatomy that you were sort of given at birth as, as long as you can, but there are cases where we need a knee replacement or we need a labral surgery or you know a discectomy or, or whatever the case may be and so we wanted to kind of walk you through that process kind of double clicking on what we talked about in a previous podcast where we talked about like well what's the progression that you should be going through if you have low back pain or shoulder impingement like you don't want to just go to the primary care and then get sent straight to the surgeon right there's mm -hmm. a couple steps progression of forces if you will that you want to go through we're kind of now talking about the the back half of that like all right we're going through the appropriate progression of forces now how do we decide if we're going to go after that last one which is you know permanent or scheduled trauma yep. aka surgery yeah so like he said once surgery is done that's something you can't take back so i always use my family as an example i would i'll tell people if this was my mother I would want to go through all of the conservative stuff before we take that last step. Now, oftentimes when patients are coming through our office, after that first visit, they may get a recommendation from us that we need three, maybe four weeks of treatment. And that's not just some arbitrary number we're, we're, we're throwing out there. What we see in a lot of the research is the suggested amount of conservative therapy that, that's needed is typically somewhere between four to six weeks. So we're not just throwing out a random number. It's more so, okay, we know if we, we can have you in here in that amount of time, we can pretty definitively decide if you're responding to care and hopefully you are or not. And in that case, which we'll touch on here in a few minutes, well, then that's where we can dip into our referral network that, that uh, a lot of the doctors here have built up over the years and we can pretty much get you in somewhere or where you need to be in a fairly quick manner. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, the, the, the process is, is, is somewhat I think patients or people in general, they want things to go quickly and they wanna be out of pain, but really long-term, in most cases, it would be better to not do surgery. So we're obviously always trying to pull out all the stops, all the tricks, anything that we can to get patients out of pain as fast as possible, um, no matter what the cause of their pain, whether it was acute or just sort of, you know, um, just repetitive strain over time or just sort of you woke up with it but we really want to try to avoid the surgery as best we can. So ways that we can do this are through, you know, doing rehab. And we've talked about this a bunch in the past where we have lots of tools, you know, joint manipulation or mobilization, dry needling, soft tissue work, McKenzie stuff. We haven't done that joke in a while, still certified. Certified. <laughs> certified. Um, so there's, there's lots of tools that we can sort of be applying here. And, as clinicians, we want to find the right tool for the job. So if somebody comes in and they're not responding to McKenzie, well, then we have other options there. So that's one, is that we want to make sure that, that we're applying the appropriate tool to the case or to the patient so that we can get the best results. Yeah. Another area that's really, really important that's not often done uh, in the rehab world, unfortunately, is most rehab is pain focused or sort of area of complaint focused. And what I mean by that is somebody comes in and they're like, hey doc, my knee hurts, you know, when I'm doing X movement, like a squat or whatever. And so then they take an X-ray of the knee or they shoot an MRI of the knee, they move the knee around a little bit and then they sort of treat the knee. Well, what we see all the time, every single day I see this, 
is that the, the pain, the area of the pain, is not where the problem is. So to stick with the McKenzie analogy that we see over and over and over again, you can have someone that has pain in the knee. It could be right in the patella. It could just be stiffness. It could be weakness. It could be aching on the side. And that can be coming from some other area. Uh, most often, it's going to be coming from the lumbar spine. So you can have an area that is causing the problem but not really expressing the pain there. So you've got a problem in your lumbar spine and you actually feel it on the outside of the knee. That happens all the time. You can also have mechanical problems that are happening upper, uh, above or below the chain, or, or, sorry, above or below the area in the kinetic chain, and that can then cause mechanical issues there. Uh -huh. So if you only are treating the knee, but you haven't addressed the foot and the ankle or the hip or the spine, then the results that you get are actually going to sort of, they just keep sort of kicking back to where they were before. So we want to make sure that we're, you are, whether it's here or somewhere else, that, that that clinician that's doing the treatments is not just looking at the area of complaint. So that's a little bit of a red flag if you walk in and you say, oh, I have a knee problem, a foot problem, or a hip problem, and all they're doing is looking at that. Right. You want to make sure that there's kind of taking that functional approach and considering the full kinetic chain so that they can not only get you out of pain, but actually improve how well you're functioning so that that joint of complaint or that area of complaint can just continue doing well and not need surgery. Yeah, and I've, I've had a case almost like that uh, in the past and a uh, person was treated for knee pain for about a year, imaging, even got a scope done, didn't really get it. Imaging looked clean on the knee. And through the exam, figured out that it was actually a referral from the back. So with that in mind, I found derangement. myself... Derangement. Uh, derangement, yeah. <clears throat> McKenzie method. Joke. <laughs> I found myself saying this to a lot of people recently that I think the biggest service that we give people here is the assessment. Obviously, the treatment's important, but what really drives our treatment is a great assessment. We're in the, we're in the business of data collection. So by going through this, this conservative plan where, where, with us where maybe we don't finish our assessment on that first visit. The assessment is something that continues visit to visit to visit. So sometimes that's why we need that three to four weeks to really get to the root of this to determine, okay, are you going to, um, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, respond. Respond to this conservative care? Too late. I was way too late. <laughs> respond to conservative care? Or do we need to take the next step? Maybe imaging, maybe something like an injection or surgery. But by the time you come or, or finish your care here, I want to be able to know as much information as possible so that I can be able to get you to exactly where you need to be and then give that next <clears throat> practitioner all of the information that we've, we've gotten. So if I've treated the knee, haven't really gotten anywhere with it, we ordered x-rays, ordered MRIs, maybe we do see something there, then I would feel much more confident saying, okay, this is a meniscus tear that just is not responding to conservative care. Here's this patient, what can you do with this? Yeah, I mean, another thing, another <laughs> reason why it takes a couple of weeks in, in a small percentage of the cases to sort of figure out are they gonna respond or not, is if there's an injury in there and there's a lot of actual chemical inflammation or tissue damage, right? If you tear a hamstring or you, you, know, you, you tear a meniscus, mm -hmm. there's actual you know, inflammation there, there's inflammatory chemicals that, that, that make the whole area more sensitive and more aggravated. And sometimes just addressing the mechanical component isn't going to clear up things enough to know, oh, this is a surgery candidate or this is not. So we need to make sure that we're doing our due diligence and oftentimes working with your primary care or other non-surgical physicians that we can kind of get, get things working there so that we can hopefully prevent the surgery. Yeah. Now, with all of this in mind, something that we discussed uh, prior to starting this chat was that Oftentimes, if you do go the surgical route first and they say, well, you got to do, you know, so many weeks of physical therapy, oftentimes that's just kind of like a, you have to go fail therapy first, not, not saying like they think PT is bad, but just go fail therapy and then we can, then we can clear through the insurance. Well, well that's, also, that's also an indication that they know that data shows that if you do wait four to six, six to eight weeks, Mm -hmm. and you just do conservative care for that amount of time, the vast majority of the time, they don't need the surgery. <clears throat> now, we don't want you to get the surgery because we would rather you actually have the anatomy that you were given at birth so that you can function as best as possible for life. They don't want you to get the surgery because they don't want to pay for it. So yeah. a surgery is going to cost 
you know, tens, even hundreds of thousands of dollars. And if they just say, no, 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 hold off for two months, and then let's kind of see where you're at at the end of the two months, there is a significant drop off of people who actually go through the surgery if they actually wait that long. Right, and that is a service that we can pro provide here. Oftentimes people think it has to be physical therapy they go to, but through how we practice here, we can definitely show through insurance, you know, that we've yeah. given conservative care. Yeah, we can then, do, you know, go ahead, we go can ahead. do conservative care, but, you know, just to kind of tie a bow on this, the, the short line we said right in the beginning, like sometimes surgery is necessary. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're going to send people to surgery really for two reasons. One, they're not responding to care or they have, you know, cardiac or neurological regressing symptoms. So like, or there, there's something going on there with like weakness in the leg or numb, like persistent numbness or something that we're like, look, this keeps getting worse. We might have to sort of like quickly sort of push you up the chain, but that's, that's a decision that we would have to make that we don't have to do very often. Right. Most of the time, if we're sending them to surgery, they're coming in and they basically, we've treated it, we've gotten them out, we've gotten them to reduce their pain, improve their function, but it's just not where it needs to be. Those are the ones that we sort of send to one of the docs that we work with. We've spent a lot of time over the last decade plus developing good relationships with physiatrists and orthopedic surgeons and neurologists so that we can match you with the right doc to give you the best care possible collectively. Right. So I didn't mention this at the beginning of the chat, but the podcast is now live on Spotify, working on a Apple podcast, but go check it out on Spotify. You know, these are about 10 minutes long, perfect for the drive in. Also visit the YouTube channel. If you want to see the video, those are up going uh, back a year. So I love the fact that we're building up this library so that you guys can go back and reference a lot of this stuff. But if you have any questions about any of the chats at any point, be sure to reach out, ask us those questions, and uh, otherwise, hope you guys have a good Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. See you guys. <laughs>